in order to be a thought leader online, you have to share your thoughts online. And what I want to do as we dive into today's, to today's content, and Aubrey, we can stay on the other slide. Um, we're going to do a couple of polls. And um, what I want to know from you, hi, Elizabeth in Florida. Hi, Wade. Hi, Kathleen. A few more of you are saying hi. Hi, um, Brenda and Jennifer. It's good to see you. Um, so the first poll says, do you prefer to curate content or create content? So today we're going to be talking a lot about content marketing. And there are two ways to share content online. You can share the content that you create yourself, or you can curate content from others. And uh, one of the clients that we have served for many, many years has grown a following and thought leadership almost primarily by curating content from others. So I'll give you a few moments to answer this poll. Um, it looks like about half of you have done so. And I'm curious to hear uh, whether you prefer to curate content or create content. All right, so I'm going to end the poll and show you those results. It looks like um, about half of you prefer to do a mixture of both and a small percentage of you primarily prefer to curate content. Um, just a quick definition or explanation. Curating content, if you don't know, um, has to do with identifying content on a particular topic that others have written and, and then sharing that. All right, so what I'd like to do is take a look at the second poll together. Um, and the second poll says, the type of content I am most likely to create to consume. So I want you to think about yourself as someone who likes to learn from others. And I haven't launched the poll yet, I see. Um, think about the type of content that you yourself prefer when you want to learn. Um, and I have a, quite a few options here. So maybe you prefer audio. So you like to listen to radio shows or podcasts. You know, maybe you like video and you want to go on YouTube to consume content. Uh, potentially your core way of learning is through books, through a long form content, or maybe you're an article reader, maybe you only learn from the emails that show up in your inbox, um, or you know, you learn from those short social media updates that you consume, or interactive, you know, you showed up on this webinar today, and you like to learn from that, or potentially you might enjoy learning more from a course that you interact with. So I'm going to give you a few moments. Um, to answer the poll. You know, one of the things that I always think about is that we assume that other people like the content that we like. So we think, you know, if we love books as our primary learning tool, we might assume that other people like that. Or if we're a big YouTube or TikTok video watcher, if you're a TikTok video watcher on this call, I'm going to be shocked. But if you are, will you tell me that in the chat? Um, or maybe you don't want to admit it. You can tell me privately, it's okay. Um, but at any, at any rate, we assume that people want to consume content the way we prefer to consume content. So I'm going to go ahead and close this poll and show you the results. Um, we're all over the map on this question, uh, but it looks like about a third of you prefer to consume written articles as your way of learning. Um, only one person answering that you like courses uh, and about 20% of you uh, like interactive webinars. So the next uh, poll question, um, thanks for the one brave soul who's admitted to watching TikTok, two brave souls who have, who have admitted it. Um, the only time I watch TikTok is if my kids, you know, show me a video, which is rare. All right, so I'm going to launch this third poll. And what I'd like to learn from this poll is the type of content that you, you are most likely to create. So what is your sweet spot in terms of creating content that you can use to grow your thought leadership? And we'll give you a few moments on that. Um, and if uh, I do have a slide in a little bit that talks about my own journey toward creating uh, thought leadership content. Aubrey, I hope that that slide made it into the deck that we have. Um, and at any rate, uh, I've had a journey. I currently create most all of these forms of content. I haven't yet written a long form traditionally published book. Um, but uh, I think that for those of us who are creating content, there's likely a sweet spot that we feel most comfortable in. So I'm curious to hear from you all uh, which one that is. And I'm going to show you those results in just a moment. So for those of you who have chosen to participate in today's webinar, it looks like we have the same sweet spot. We have this convergence that you like to consume articles as your primary way of consuming content, and you like to write articles as your primary way of um, 
sharing content. So that's interesting. Um, there's not a, yeah, not a person on the call here who prefers or is most likely to create video. And um, that's pretty interesting. So, um, you know, I think that this poll in a way informally um, backs up my idea that uh, we create the content that we're most likely to consume. And we make this assumption that everyone wants to consume the type of content that we enjoy consuming. So um, as you think about growing thought leadership, there's this overarching idea that in order to be a thought leadership leader online, you have to share your thoughts online. And so what I want you to be able to do also, and Aubrey, we can probably go to that next slide, um, is you really want to think about, hmm, ah, uh, so Bill, you're interested in several and the poll asked for the top. Thanks, thanks for sharing that. We did not give people um, choices as it relates to selecting more than one. Um, Wade says that he likes video, uh, but Wi-Fi uploads are a strain on bandwidth. So as it relates to creating content to build your thought leadership, you obviously have a ton of choices about the type of content that you might create. And before you decide what kind of content you want to create, you want to think about who you are creating content for. And, you know, I made a joke about TikTok, but if you're creating content for young adults or teenagers, obviously that's a channel that you might want to consider. And so you want to always think about the audience that you're writing to and what content will be of most value for them, what they're most likely to access. Um, and you also want to really think about what are their felt needs, what are the topic areas that they most need to know. And, you know, quite often we will attract an audience who's interested in the type of content that we're creating. So I want to just tell you briefly about my own journey creating content in case it's of help to you as you think about the content that you want to create in the world. So I began my journey blogging back in about 2009. And I was certainly most comfortable with that, you know, three to 500 word. Uh, sharing, sharing an idea quickly. Not to be clear, when I look at, back at some of those earliest blog posts, some of them are terrible. Um, but the important part was that I was beginning to, you know, really think through what I had to offer, what value I could share with audiences, and my most comfortable uh, content sharing was with blogging. Now, I did um, soon after I started sharing blog posts, I also began to write some longer form eBooks. And some of the, those are still available now. Uh, some of those were a compilation of blog posts on a certain theme. And I really enjoyed um, once I had uh, started to share blog posts to then share a little bit longer form content with the people who were looking to me uh, to share my insights with them. One of the earliest eBooks I wrote was about Twitter. It's actually still available for sale on, on Kindle. Um, it will be available for free on our website. Again, it is not currently there. Um, so after my kind of foray into blogging and eBooks, I had this woman who was building a new business around video content approach me and encourage me to start to create video. And I have to tell you, the process of creating video, this is probably about 2012, maybe the first year I was in business, I was completely terrified by it. I hated doing video. It took me gazillions of takes to come up with anything that now if I look at it, you know, I would not say was decent. Thankfully, all that early video is not on the internet now. Um, but I did have a short stint doing video. I didn't love doing video. Um, but at the time, it was all the rage. So I tried it. Um, in about 2013, our team started to do interactive webinars, and we were most often at that time uh, using the webinars to showcase our clients' content. Um, but along the way, that really did help me to build um, a following of people who attended those leadership book or business book focused webinars. And just last year, we launched our first podcast. So that, so that was really my first kind of step into the creation of audio. Um, and so when you when you think about thought leadership, um, and no matter what modality of content you choose, you know, you want, you want to find the convergence between the type of content that you're comfortable creating and the type of content that your audience most wants to have from you, most want to have from you. And as my journey represents, you know, you may try one form of thought leadership content and pivot to another. And at a certain point, it may be that you're that you are uh, sharing your content in many of the different modalities. Um, 
So as you think about thought leadership, you first want to think about your thoughts. So what is it that you think about frequently, that you rant about, that you're wanting to share about? And back to my original kind of overarching idea, to be a thought leader online, you have to share your thoughts online. And so um, that's that's really um, where we want to start is um, by identifying that content that you want to share, not only the modality, but also the the actual content of it. Um, and the second part is leadership, which requires a commitment to show up with your point of view. Um, if you are a listener of our podcast, I would reference the podcast with Peter Winnick that I did a couple of weeks ago. And one of the things that he said is, you know, it, it really is about the courage to share your ideas. It's about the courage to um, really put a point of view out into the world. So, um, as it relates to identifying thought leadership, what I want to do is to encourage you to really think about what it is that you're known for. Um, I want to encourage you to think about those topics of expertise that you can bring to add value to others. And then you want to think about what it is that you want to share with others. And uh, Elizabeth is asking where you can go to watch our podcasts. And Aubrey may be able to grab that link for you and put it into the chat. So. Um, I'm curious, and we don't have a poll, so I'll need to see your um, answers in the chat. Um, if you're on this call today, have you begun yet to create thought leadership content? Um, if you have, give me a simple yes. If you're just getting started on the journey, um, give me a simple no. Um, it looks like I'm getting mostly yeses. I see a, a couple of no's. So if you have already begun to create and share thought leadership content, and it looks like most of you have, um, what you want to do is to really think about where that wealth of content exists. So it looks like um, some of you have created but not shared, um, and that's that's helpful. So. Anything that you have previously created is a wealth that can fuel your thought leadership. And, you know, I've been creating thought leadership content since 2009 in all these various forms that are on the slide. Um, and so as a result, when I look at what I want to do to continue to build thought leadership, what I do is I look at what I've already created and I think about how I can best repurpose and reuse that and leverage it over time. And it may be that you um, that you have some blog posts. It may be that you have articles. Uh, you might have some stuff on your hard drive um, to the point of the folks who have said they've created content but not shared it. You may have created short form content on various social channels. Um, you may have traditionally published books, self-published books, self-published eBooks. You might have videos or podcasts. So as you think about growing influence in 2021 through your thought leadership, you want to first, if you've already Already been creating thought leadership content, you want to first have an inventory of all that content so that you can effectively repurpose and reuse that content over time. And for those of you who are really interested in writing a book, but you haven't written a book yet, one of the things that you want to think about is that it's likely that all the content that you've created up till now could be repurposed and reformed to create this amazing asset called a book. And for those of you who may or may not know, I do have a book uh, proposal that I'm waiting on hearing about. And the other day, uh, my team happened to share this article on LinkedIn about how creating, creating value or something takes time, I forget. Um, I can try to find the link and share it later. But at any rate, when I read it, I thought, you know what, that's actually content that can go on my book. And so I would encourage all of you to think about that. If there is a topic that you are passionate about that will one day become your book, any content that you've been creating, and for me, that goes back a decade, or actually more than a decade, if I started in 2009, um, all that content that I've been creating for more than a decade, uh, some of it might eventually coalesce to become my book. And so if you're interested in writing a book, you want to really be thinking about that. Now, if you've already written a book, and this slide happens to be an opposite of the slide I showed before, then your book can fuel your ongoing thought leadership as you break it down and share it over time in these various ways. And so you always want to think about any of the content that you that you want to create and share as being a liquid asset that you have that can be reshaped and reformed and repurposed over time to, 
to provide value to your audiences so that you can make a bigger difference in the world uh, through your thought leadership. So you have basically those two ways of going about it. Either you have this asset called a book that can become all sorts of different kinds of content, or you have all this content that you've been creating that eventually can coalesce to become your book. Um, and so Mary has a question, what about reusing content in books that you've written and had published that are copyrighted? So I am not an attorney, and so I don't wanna advise you about copyright. However, um, what I would advise you to do is to really look at that book contract and really think about uh, or identify with your publisher. Most of the time, it's the book as a whole that is copyrighted and you as the author do have the opportunity for marketing purposes to re purpose and reshare that content. But you would want to confirm that, Mary, with your publisher or with your attorney. Um, and I hope that helps. Um, so there are a number of different ways that you can repurpose your content. So you can take longer form content like a book and make it shorter form like an article. You can take shorter form like that uh, article, Changing the World Takes Time, uh, that Aubrey just shared. And, and that can become part of a longer form work. Or if you have a number of blog posts, they could be put together to have it uh, to create a longer form ebook. So you can take things that are text and make them visual. You can take things that are um, text and make them video. You can take things that are text and make them interactive. Um, the other thing that you can do is you can take something that's text and you can actually, uh, I mean, something interactive and turn it into text. So one of the things that my team and I are doing right now is that we are recording this webinar. When we record this webinar, a utility called Otter AI will create a written transcript. And I expect uh, time allowing that I will take some of the interactive content that I'm creating right now and make it into an article that I'll put out on my LinkedIn tomorrow. So um, there are just so many ways that you can take one, um, one asset and you can repurpose it and reuse it over time. So as we think about growing influence through uh, I can't see the words on the slide because of my chat. So when you want to think about growing influence through content marketing, what you want to be able to do is to think about this equation. So you want content that you're creating that's of value. Then next, you want consistency in creating content, which actually requires that you set a pace for content marketing that you can sustain. So first you want content of value that you're creating plus consens consistency in creating content of value over time and it has to be sustainable. And then the result that you'll get is that you will increase your thought leadership influence over time. So it's really simple. You think about the type of content that you can create, how it will add value for your audience, and then you focus on ensuring that you create a consistent and sustainable practice. And over time you'll see your thought leadership influence grow. Um, but it is definitely over time, across time. Um, oh, that's weird. I made that fly in. Yeah. Um, so just a couple of things um, before we go to a few questions. Um, the way that our team envisions planning for content in order to grow our influence is we do it thematically. Now, this month, our theme happens to be, if you want to guess, it's about growing thought leadership. And so all throughout the month of January, what we're doing is we're sharing content from the past on the topic, new content that we're creating like this webinar and our podcasts. Um, and so what we do is we look at the content that we have that's existing, we look for gaps and from those gaps, we decide uh, what new content we wanna create and we put all of that on an editorial calendar. Now, most of the time a theme is more for the person creating the content than it is for the audience because it's likely that you could follow what I'm doing you know, on social and on my webinars and on my podcast and you might not pick up that we have a theme, but I'm telling you today, we have a theme. We have a theme each month throughout the year um, and all the content that we're creating and sharing maps to that theme. Now, the beauty of that is if you think about repurposing content and you think about a year of themes, at the end of the year, what we've done is we've organized and bucketed our, our value in the world. And so that could become any number of things. So on the topic of thought leadership, we could choose to take all the content that we're doing about thought leadership and make a course about it. Or we could choose to take all the content that we're doing about thought leadership and write a book about it or an ebook. Uh, we could take all the content on thought leadership and make it into an interactive course. 
And so as you want to increase your thought leadership over time, you can really think about uh, making sure that you're creating content that can add value for your audiences in lots of different ways. Um, and I find that to be like super exciting and fun so that I could take some questions and I am watching the chat. So if you wanna put those questions in the chat, I will be happy to answer them. Um, and I see some comments here. So I'll read, Rob says, consistency seems critical. I started an online presence two years ago with at least three posts per week. Followers grew quickly early, but leveled out. And posting consistently along with varying hashtags keeps followership growing. That's a really great point. Rob, you know, I feel like consistency is one of the most critical pieces. Um, and again, we did have a podcast this week. I don't know if any of you follow Dan Rockwell, but Dan Rockwell, in my mind is one of the best examples of growing influence through consistency. He started blogging around 2009 or 10 and has blogged for the most part five days a week without a break over this entire period. Um, and I loved catching up with Dan on the podcast. So I would encourage you if you like Dan, you can read it if you prefer to read on the, on the blog or you can listen to it on the podcast. Yeah, and Dan, Dan just is amazing and knocking out those 300 words every single weekday, um, you know, over a decade. It's phenomenal. So I'm happy to take some questions. Um, so I'm, I have a question here about will I share both slide decks? I think that what we'll do is, is get our, ourselves together and um, that's getting me together and we'll create one PDF from from the deck, including all the slides, and get that out to you with the follow-up materials. Thanks for, thanks for the question. Um, I'm happy to share the slides, of course. So I want to let you know about next month's webinar. Um, next month, we are doing a theme, and the overarching idea is about choosing a publishing approach. So those of you who are thinking about thought leadership might also be thinking about that asset of a book that you might one day create. And um, so on that webinar, we're going to talk about the pros and cons of traditional publishing, of self-publishing, and of hybrid publishing. And so that you know, since I told you our secret, um, on the next webinar, uh, we're going to go into greater detail on all those publishing approaches on the podcast next month. So I've already recorded next month's podcast, and we have Kristen France from Barrett Kohler Publisher talking about traditional publishing. I talked to uh, the founder of Page Two, which is a hybrid publisher, about the benefits of hybrid publishing. And then I, mm, I, I don't know that I interviewed anyone about specific just self-publishing, but I did um, uh, interview a ghostwriter who really talks about what it might take to use a ghostwriter. And then I also interviewed an agent. Um, so next month is phenomenal. And um, and we're going to talk about choosing a publishing approach. I think that we are almost out of time. If there are any additional questions, I'm watching the chat. Um, but I appreciate all of you investing 30 minutes of your day with me. We will get the follow up out to you soon. I'm always happy to connect with you on social. Um, in terms of blogs and where they're hosted, um, I don't know, um, Brenda, if you're asking about my blogs, I do have a personal website at beckyrobinson.com. I do not um, often post there. We do have blogs on weavinginfluence.com. And so I'm not sure the question, but um, Brenda, if you want to. Um, so Rob is asking me what has been my most effective platform for thought leadership. Rob, I'm gonna send that question back to you. Uh, where have you gotten the most value from my thought leadership? Um, and, and if so, maybe that's the most effective platform. I really think the one thing we didn't talk about today is email marketing, um, and email as a means of growing thought leadership overall, in terms of marketing, I think email is the most effective conversion tool. And I think that people who receive my emails every week, um, you know, begin to feel like they get to know me, um, so I think it's possible that it's emails, but it, it could be the webinars that I've been doing, or, or it could be, mm, I don't know. Uh, Rob, uh, did you hear my question back to you? What, where have you gotten the most value from my thought leadership? Uh, that might be the answer, but um, I'll do some thinking on that. What has been my most effective platform for thought leadership? Aubrey, what do you think? Um, I would probably say you're blog. I think the podcast 
I'm really excited about the podcast, but that's fairly new. So, well, and for those of you who don't know, Aubrey is the brains behind all of the weaving influence marketing kind of plans and approaches at the moment. Um, and we've been partnering really closely on the podcast. So I think, you know, we're only about 36 episodes in, so we haven't yet really been able to, you know, check to see, uh, you know, what value that podcast is having for our audiences. I'm getting a lot of comments, though, that people think the webinars with the top tier authors where these webinars are the most valuable platform. Um, Rob sees me the most on Instagram. So really all Rob knows about is my running, right? <laughs> So thanks again to all of you who have invested some time with us today. We want to honor the 30 minutes that you plan to be here and wrap up for now. Um, I am on Instagram. So if you want to find me, Instagram is not on this slide. We can add it next time. But my handle is the same everywhere. It's my first name and my last name without the vowels. So thanks for those of you who joined. I look forward to connecting with you again soon. I hope you'll join that uh, next month's marketing focused webinar about publishing choices. And uh, we do have some other upcoming webinars with authors coming in the near future as well. So I look forward to seeing you again soon. Have a great day.